Tonight we're talking about George V. He's kind of known as being uninspiring, a bit dull, actually labeled that by a biographer, but he actually founded the House of Windsor. So he, that's why he's the first talk in the series. It's actually interesting to know that he was never expected to become king, and there's actually three monarchs in the House of Windsor that were never expected to actually be a monarch. And aside from George V, that's George VI and Elizabeth II. So George was born June 3rd, 1565 at Marlborough House. This house was in London. It was a royal residence at that time. He had an older brother, Albert Victor, so he was the second son and he and Albert Victor were only 17 months apart. So they were educated together by their tutor, John Dalton, and some nannies as well. Their parents, his father was King Edward VII. He was the son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. So Edward's children were actually born in the reign of Victoria. Queen Alexandra, his mother, was a Danish princess, and she was the daughter of Christian IX and Louise of Hesse Castle. So George and his siblings kind of feared their father, but they still loved him, and their mother was very popular. She was very fashionable. He also had three sisters, Victoria, Maud, who had become Queen of Norway, and Louise. He had two famous cousins, both who would have a role in World War I, and that was Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was on the opposing side as King of Germany during the war. And there was also Tsar Nicholas II, who unfortunately ended up murdered by the Bolsheviks in 1918. So you might be wondering, what does a second son do? What is his purpose besides being a spare in case something happens? He was actually expected to have a career in the Navy or some part of the military. He enrolled in the Navy at 12 years old with his brother, Albert Victor. Albert Victor wasn't really progressing the way the Royals had hoped he was, he probably had ADHD or some other type of issue with learning. So they ended up going to into the Navy together, kind of to help each other navigate life. And military influenced George's entire career. He was extremely structured for the remainder of his life. What time he ate, what time he napped, how long he napped, when he put in his stamp collection, how long he worked on his stamp collection, when he went to bed, when he had dinner, how long dinner was to last. So this was done partly because of the military training he had had. He became a cadet training on the HMS Britannia at Dartmouth, and he served on the HMS Bicante with Dalton and his brother, Albert Victor. They saw the Caribbean, South Africa, Australia, South America, East Asia, and even Norfolk, Virginia. In Japan, Albert Victor and George were received by Emperor Meiji. They presented him with two wallabies they got from Australia. So when they got home, Victoria was actually horrified that neither of her grandsons had learned French or German. She decides to send them to France to immerse with the culture and learn French. Neither of them were able to master French. She was horrified that none of her grandchildren would be able to learn a language. It was just not their strong suit. In fact, during George's whole reign, people remarked how horrible he was at languages. 
So the princes eventually had to be separated. Albert Victor had to go to Cambridge to go to university and also train to eventually one day be king. So George ends up staying in the Royal Navy. He learned to become a commander and he was on the torpedo, the thrush, in North Africa and West Indies. He traveled on the Melampus in 1891 to 1892 and he did most of his Navy work under his uncle, Alfred, Prince of Edinburgh. Tragically, Albert Victor passes away. He gets pneumonia. He dies at Sandringham after Christmas. He was actually a victim of the 1892 flu pandemic. At the time, Albert Victor, who is also called Eddie by the family, was the Duke of Clarence and Avondale. There were several rumors surrounding him. There were rumors that he was involved in the Cleveland Street scandal, which means he was going to an all-male brothel. And so, to defuse these homosexual allegations, Victoria sent him to India for several months, around seven months actually, to make sure the scandal died down before he returned. There were also rumors that he was Jack the Ripper and committed some of the murders in London. These claims were unfounded. We actually are able to prove that he was not in London at the times of the murder, yet these claims persist and they are well documented online or in books. At the time, Albert Victor was engaged to Mary of Tech a princess from a minor family in Württemberg. He really wanted to marry Princess Helene of New Orleans. She was the daughter of the pretender of the French throne. So even though France no longer had a monarchy, they still had pretenders, descendants of the final monarchs of France. So George eventually has some marriage options. He wanted to marry Princess Marie, one of his cousins, but she turns him down. Another option was Princess Victoria Melita of Edinburgh. But he ends up not marrying either of them. He and Mary, Princess Mary of Tech, actually become very close after Albert Victor's death, although she is devastated about his loss and about a year later, they are engaged. He is very shy, so his sister Louise invites Mary over to her house for tea. George is at the house when she gets there, and Louise breaks the ice. George, isn't there something you might want to ask Mary? And so he takes her into Louise's garden, and he proposes and she accepts. She's very happy to be part of the royal family. Her mother was actually a cousin of Queen Victoria's. So Mary's mother, Mary Adeline of Cambridge, is also, like Victoria, a granddaughter of George III. It was actually predicted by newspapers that this would happen although it did not influence a love story at all. They did grow to love one another, though they both had difficulty expressing their feelings. They do so more in their diaries and letters to one another. So Mary and George have the first public royal wedding in 32 years. And it's at Buckingham Palace that George accidentally sees Mary he gives her a low bow, a gesture she remembers for the rest of her life. The royal parties come in four large carriages. In the procession, they have open land house. So first comes the help in royal household. The second come George, the Duke of York, and his supporters. Then Mary comes, the Duke of Tech, 
her father. And lastly, Queen Victoria, the Duchess of Teck, and her brothers, Frederick and Alexander. Mary is very shy. It takes her a long time to gain her confidence in the royal family, but she gives the public a sideways smile and a nervous gesture. So Mary has a total of five bridesmaids and five junior bridesmaids. She has Princess Victoria and Maud of Wales. She has cousins Victoria, Melita, Alexandra, Beatrice of Edinburgh. She has Princess Margaret and Patricia of Conneaut. She has Alice and Victoria, Eugenie of Battenberg. Alice meaning Prince Philip's mother. She also has Princess Helena Victoria of Schwelzleg Holstein. And the Duke of York, George, had the Prince of Wales, his father, and his uncle, the Duke of Edinburgh. And the wedding was officiated by the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of London. After the wedding, George and Mary go to Buckingham Palace and wave on the balcony. The marriage register was signed by the Queen and the current Prime Minister. Mary, also known as May, the month she was born in, also gets her Royal Highness or HRH title. Mary and George go to Sandringham for their honeymoon. And for many years, they would live on the Sandringham estate at York Cottage. Her dress was originally going to be the Lily of the Valley design, which was leaked during her engagement to Albert Victor. So they changed the entire design for her wedding to George. It was actually nicknamed the May Silks. It had the rose, a shamrock, and thistle. And it was done by Linton and Curtis and Arthur Silver. The white silk was done by Albert Parchment. Her veil had diamond pins given by Queen Victoria. She wore her mother's veil and she had a diamond tiara from Victoria, a diamond rivier from her in-laws, the Prince and Princess of Wales, and she had diamond earrings she wore from George. Her dress was entirely manufactured in England and her mother was actually president of the National Silk Association. So Mary and George would go on to have five children, or six children, five lived to adulthood. So she had Edward, who was expected to inherit the throne. She had Mary, who George really wanted to be close to. He was really excited to have a daughter, and that was his only daughter. But she was really quite wary of him, so unfortunately they did not get particularly close. They had their son Albert and he had a stutter and knocked knees. He also had stomach issues. George had a lot of lack of understanding about this stutter. He always was yelling, get it out, which made Albert's stutter actually worse, made him a very nervous young man, young child. He also had Henry and Henry also had a speech impediment. Henry uh, was unable to pronounce certain letters and he had a high pitched voice, much more than the norm. Their son George became kind of a playboy prince and a partier later in his life. And they have Prince John, who we'll talk about later. Prince John is really quite a tragic story in the royal family, one that is lesser known, and he will get his own slide later. <coughs> so George actually had this idea that it was better to be feared than loved by his children. And his children actually did fear him, but they also resented him because he ran his household, including his children, like a military. It was actually, it took 
two years for Mary and George to realize that their two oldest sons were being abused by a nanny. She would pinch them before they would see their parents, so they were always crying when their parents saw them. They were also away so often that their son, Henry, did not recognize them when they came back from a long royal tour. He actually cried for his nanny when his mother picked him up. And it really offended her to the point that her two oldest sons had to go and hug her to diffuse the tension in the situation. And it was not until Lala Bill, Charlotte, one of their favorite nannies, reported that one of the nannies was abusing the children that Mary actually fired this nanny. Otherwise, it would have taken much longer for them to notice, and we don't know when they would have noticed. So Victoria actually dies in 1901. And this is when George becomes the Prince of Wales, next in line to the throne. Eventually, he was presented as the Duke of Cornwall. He did many royal tours, some to Malta, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Canada. These tours were designed by Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain and Lord Salisbury, the Prime Minister. George gave South African war medals to colonial troops and opened the Australia Parliament upon the creation of the Commonwealth. He also visited New Zealand. He made some naval reforms. Cadets could be enrolled at 12 or 13 years old and he developed a standard educational program. In 1905 and 1906, George and Mary toured India, and George was quite disgusted by the racial inequality. He also went to the wedding of King Alfonso XIII to Victoria Eugenie of Battenberg. This wedding actually had a bomb threat at it. And it was by an anarchist. The royals escaped the assassination attempt. He was also there for the coronation of Haikon VII and Queen Maud, so he was able to attend his own sister's coronation. So George's father only rules for around nine years. And so, on May 6, 1910, George becomes king on the death of his father. George decides that his father should lie in state. And this is because his father was actually the first monarch to go out in public and meet with the people. He actually engaged with the public. Queen Victoria, after her husband's death, mainly retreated inside for the remainder of her life. She rarely met the public, and this was heavily criticized. So Edward VII and Alexandra of Denmark made an effort to really get to know the public. And also, George had to accept an accession declaration, swearing oath to the country that he would become king and do everything he could for the UK and its Commonwealth nations and the empire. It had very anti-Catholic phrasing in it. And George refused to sign it until those phrases were removed, just because he was defender of the faith and the majority of the people in the UK were members of the Church of England, didn't mean there were other people in the country who were Catholic. So he has his coronation on June 22nd, 1911. And at the time, it was the last event attended by other royals of other countries. But we'll see on May 6th, 2023, that there are several 
foreign royals coming to the upcoming coronation. The 1911 coronation was planned by the Earl Marshal Henry Fitzalan Howard, the 15th Duke of Norfolk. And it's tradition that the Duke of Norfolk actually plans the coronation. It was limited to a congregation of 6,000 people. Mary's gown had silk satin. It had the symbols of Great Britain and the empire. It had the Tudor rose. It had Scottish thistle and the shamrock for Ireland and the Indian lotus. It also had the Star of India and English oak leaves and acorns embroidered by the Princess Louise Needlework School, had a taffeta bodice trimmed at the neck and designed by Revel and Rossier. It also had embroidery done by Jessie Charlotte Robinson. The order of service was done by Claude Jenkins, the Lambus Palace librarian who was supervised by the Dean of Westminster. And Mary was crowned with the Co E Nor diamond, which is very controversial, which is why they are removing it for the coronation. So there were three processions in carriages. First, they had the foreign royals and the government officials. They had the royal family, officers, and in a gold stagecoach, the king and queen. They were surrounded by equerries and yeomen of the guard and armed forces. The Indian cavalry and royal house guards were also there. And after the service, they went back around in reverse order. It's estimated that there were about 45,000 soldiers that participated in the coronation. At the end, the king and queen waved on the Buckingham Palace balcony. But George makes an interesting point in his diary about becoming king. And that is that when you become the monarch, it's because you lose, oftentimes, a beloved parent. And he says, I have lost my best friend and the best of fathers. I never had a crossword with him in my life. And he goes on to say, may God give me strength and guidance in the heavy task which has fallen on me. So we're going to get into some very difficult political situations for George. So when he became king, there was actually a constitutional crisis in Parliament. And he would go on later to say this was actually the hardest part of his entire reign, because he had just started. And he didn't really know as much as he had hoped about the political situation and felt people were trying to take advantage of him being the new monarch. So the Liberal Party wanted to restrict power in the House of Lords, and the Conservatives could not accept this. So their laws could only be passed by making Liberal peers. It was a very unstable government, and Edward VII allegedly, according to Prime Minister Asquith, said he'd create peers and he needed more. And he comes to George about the issue and they talked about it. George eventually agreed as he feared cabinet would resign. He feared people would walk out, the government wouldn't be able to function. What would they do? He had no powers to really create a, a functional government or participate in government as a constitutional monarch. Eventually, the two parties come to an agreement, and George never has to make peers. He was so relieved. We also have the issue is of home rule, and that's about Ireland. So Ireland wanted their own parliament in Ireland. Right now, they were being represented in Britain they wanted it on their own soil. There was a lot of opposition from Northern Ireland who wanted things to continue as it was, and the Conservatives 
The liberals were more understanding about the situation, but it got put on hold because in 1914, World War I breaks out. George was only known for a few hobbies compared to his father who liked gambling, had mistresses all around court, was always having a party. George was known for being dull. He actually hated those aspects about his father and he was determined to do the opposite. So he had a stamp collection. He was known for putting stamps in it every day. He actually collected thousands of stamps over his lifetime, many which have been donated to the Royal Collection. And one day a courtier came to George and said, did you hear about that damned fool who spent over a thousand pounds on a stamp? Like who does that? And he goes, I am that damned fool. <laughs> he had bought the stamp as anonymous, so nobody know, knew he bought it. But he just didn't want anybody to know. He also shot birds most of his life. He always carried around a bag to put his birds in that he shot. Harold Nicholson, his royal biographer, claimed that as he was Duke of York, all he did was kill animals and stick in stamps. So in World War I, three members of the royal household actually died in the war. Over 500 served in the war itself. Part of the Royal Mews at Buckingham was converted into a medical ward and some horses were used. He would actually make six visits to the front during his reign and during the war. So in Britain, we don't have Uncle Sam to recruit you to the army and the military. You have the king. The king is the main symbol of Great Britain at this time. It says, come into the ranks and fight for your king and country. Don't stay in the crowd and stare. You are wanted at the front. Enlist today. And some of these posters even had George's face on them. Fight for your king. So this really affected his emotional state, that people were actually dying on behalf of Great Britain, but also for him. There was the riding school, which housed catering troops. George first visited the front in 1914. He also met heads of state, visited the wounded, and inspected troops. He also gave up alcohol and entertaining. And although al giving up alcohol didn't inspire a temperance movement, people appreciated it. Queen Mary reduced menus. In 1915, George was visiting the troops in France. The crowds were cheering. Everybody was so happy to see their king come and visit them. Unfortunately, George's horse was spooked. At first, he was able to control the horse, but the crowd cheered again, and the horse threw him off. And so George broke his pelvis. He never quite recovered from this injury. The entire royal family got involved in the war effort. Their son Edward, the Prince of Wales, had an officer role on the Western Front. Non-combat, he actually was very resentful of this. He wanted to fight. He was absolutely angry and irate that he could not, but he was determined to see what it was like. So he made a lot of visits to trenches and to see the soldiers and what they were going through. Mary Princess Royal visited several hospitals, especially with her mother, Queen Mary. She also created a royal box fund where they sent cigars to troops with spices around Christmas. It was hugely successful. Their second son, Albert, or Bertie, actually participated in the Navy. He was in a battle, and that was the Battle of Jutland in the North Sea off the coast of Denmark. 
you can actually be in battle if you are the spare. So he was under Sir John Jellicoe in 1916. The battle only lasted two days, but it was extremely important. It assured control of shipping lanes and British naval dominance. The royal family also participated in National Days of Prayer. In 1917, we get the House of Windsor name change. So originally, the name Saxe Coburg and Gotha comes from Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, who is German. Unfortunately, during the war, there were a number of British subjects that thought because the royal family was German and had a German name, they must have been supporting Germany. There was also another unfortunate situation, and that was the Gotha aircraft. It was a heavy bomber that began in 1916, and it was the first mass-produced large airplane. There were air raids on London. They started in 1915, but with the Gotha, it was ramped up in 1917. 14 of these planes reached London. 162 civilians were killed. 432 were injured, some mutilated beyond recognition. There was also a primary school that was hit called Upper North Street School and it lost 18 children. 37 were injured, many five to six years old. And the king and queen sent a message with a wreath. So eventually they changed their name to Windsor, just like the castle in Windsor in the Berkshires. There were also other families that changed their names. Tech was changed to Cambridge and Battenberg to Mountbatten. Upon hearing the rumors that he may be alien or not British, that he might be supporting Germany, George said, I may be uninspiring, but I'll be damned if I'm alien. So in 1917, he also creates the letters patent. And that states, what defines a prince or princess? What gives somebody his or her Royal Highness title. It actually slims down the monarchy. So people in Germany and Austria-Hungary are not claiming to be the prince and princess or a duke and duchess of Great Britain. The letters patent state that the children of any sovereign of these realms and the children of the sons of any such sovereign of the eldest living son of the Prince of Wales shall have and at all times enjoy the royal title of Royal Highness. So you can alter this if you issue a new letters patent. And so that is when Queen Elizabeth II had grandchildren, she did issue a letters patent. And it was because her son William or grandson William, the Duke of Cambridge, had three children. And only one of his title, his sons, was entitled to His Royal Highness, a prince. So she issued a letters patent so all three of the children could have prince and princess title. So in the 1500s, we may execute you for committing treason. But in 1917, 1918, we just deprive you of your royal titles. So enemies during World War I would be stripped of their titles. And at the end of the war, four people, four royals were stripped of their titles. And that is His Royal Highness Charles Edward, Duke of Albany, His Royal Highness, Ernest August, Duke of Cumberland, His Royal Highness Ernest August, Duke of Brunswick, the Duke of Cumberland's son, and Henry Viscount Taff, 
who also lost an Austrian title in addition to peers of Ireland. And so George wanted to create for chivalry and people's service the Order of the British Empire, which he did in 1917. It is a reward for arts and sciences, charity, welfare, and public service. In highest to lowest order, it has the Knight of the Grand Cross, Knight Commander, Commander, Most Excellent Order, Member of Most Excellent. If you are a woman, you aren't a knight, you are made a dame. The Order of the British Empire is still in use today. So unfortunately during the war, there were some tragedies in the family. And one was the murder of the Romanoff family. And George and Mary made the decision not to rescue the Russian royal family. And there were several reasons for this. It was partly because Mary didn't really like her cousin, the wife of Tsar Nicholas II, who was Alexandra. She was German, didn't really go well with the anti-German sentiment. They also didn't want a monarchy coming to the UK that had already been deposed. People would be wondering why, oh, the Russian royal family no longer has any power. They were overthrown in Russia. Do we want to overthrow our monarchy? It might pose those types of questions. So it was an extremely ruthless decision that they made, which actually the Prime Minister David Lloyd George took the fall for for many years until they unearthed some of the royal papers which had this information on it. Of course, George and Mary were devastated when their cousins had been murdered. They actually rescued two survivors, the Tsar's sister and mother, the following year. But between two sad moments, I'm actually going to put some happy ones in here. So George and Mary's children got married and had their own children. The first wedding picture up at the top left is their son Albert's and his wife um, Elizabeth Bowes Lyons wedding photo. They were married in 1923 and she was actually not part of nobility or royalty at all. Though she was the daughter of an earl, one in Scotland, the Earl of Strathmore and Klingorn. Their daughter Mary married the Earl of Harewood in Yorkshire. She and Henry got married in 1922. They split their time between Yorkshire and London. And they also had their sons Henry and George get married as well. George actually married the royal princess of Greece named Marina. She actually, those two were the last really royal dynastic marriage in history. Marina's cousin was actually Prince Philip who was at the occasion and they had a page girl at the wedding named Elizabeth. She would one day become Elizabeth II, the queen. They were still children then. They didn't really interact at the wedding, but this is the first time they were in a room together. So all their children married. They began to have children. Lilibet was a particular favorite. Elizabeth II, as a child, was called Lilibet because she could not pronounce her name correctly. Even George called her that. And he was not one for real nicknames, but he did call her that. Um, and she was probably his favorite grandchild. And so there's another sad story. We have Prince John, and he was the youngest child of Mary and George. Unfortunately, he suffered from epilepsy. And starting at age four, 
he began to have seizures. So initially, he really was a full-fledged member of the family. He was often seen at events. But unfortunately, as he got older, he was removed from the public. He went to Wood Farm at the Sandringham Estate to live out his life. Eventually, he was unable to have local children play with him anymore, but he did for a period of time. And he was taken care of by his loving nanny, Charlotte Lala Bill. And it was Lala who held him in her arms after he died at 13 from a severe seizure in the month after Christmas of 1919. And so you get two very, very different reactions from their son. Mary and George rushed to Wood Farm. They were devastated about the loss, but they took comfort in the fact that their child was no longer suffering. Unfortunately from, for some of their children, it was a relief that Prince John was dead. And that's because their son Edward the Prince of Wales said he had become more of an animal than anything else to his at the time mistress, Frida Dudley Ward. On the other hand, their son Albert, the Duke of York, said how sorry he was that he could not see Prince John in previous years. And Mary got a letter so insensitive from Edward, the Prince of Wales, that she actually burned it to protect his reputation. We never know, knew what it said. So George wanted to remember the fallen. So did the rest of the country after the war. And so he unveiled the Cenotaph. It is a memorial to all the fallen and missing in World War I. That was done Remembrance Day, November 11th of 1920. And he also was chief mourner at the funeral for the tomb of the Unknown Warrior. The Unknown Warrior was a British subject that died in France and was mutilated so badly that nobody knew who exactly he was. But they took him in a coffin back to the UK and he was buried at Westminster Abbey in memory of all the fallen. And George was actually the chief mourner at that funeral. And it's actually a tradition today to, at royal weddings, put your bouquet on the tomb of the unknown known warrior. And this was started in 1923 by the former queen mother or Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. So eventually Ireland does get its dominion status it gets its own government, and Northern Ireland stays with the UK. They are officially partitioned into the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland in the early 1920s. The Labour Party also becomes a major party in the UK, replacing the Liberal Party. We also have the fall of several monarchies. The Russian one, the Portuguese one, German, and Austro-Hungarian. In 1922, the British family rescues the Greek royal family with the HMS Calypso as they were banished. They were banished because Prince Andrew actually disobeyed military orders and he broke rules in the military and they were banished. So there's instability with the Greek government and they are forced into exile. They eventually settle in Paris. If you recognize that little boy in the picture, you may or may not, that is actually Prince Philip when he is a young child. So the statue of Westminster creates self-government for the Commonwealth. So Commonwealth countries are finally able to have their own government. There's equality between Britain and other countries, which is declared in the Balfour 
Declaration in 1926. We have the Great Depression, and during this period, May and George actually give severance pay for the royal household staff that have to be let go. The national government has Stanley Baldwin and Sir Herbert Samuel, who create Ramsay MacDonald as the first Labor Prime Minister. Unfortunately, MacDonald didn't have much support from his own party. Mary went to buy British goods at sales. Whenever she bought something, she would put a little sign saying purchased by Queen Mary. She also had more debutantes presented at court, thinking that she would create more trade for dressmakers. She also encouraged every home to have a teapot in it. And she talked about the importance of her having a teapot and using it every morning. So the Prince of Wales, Edward, had the something must be done campaign, making himself very popular with the public. He visited the mining community. And the Duke of York, Albert, created camps for boys and hoped to bring classes together regardless of social standing. He was also a gardener and he fixed up his own home to lessen the burden on British subjects who would have to foot the bill. When politicians would talk to George about strikes or the public complaining about budget cuts or wage cuts, he always said, try living on their wages before you judge them. He was also very concerned about another war brewing. And he said, I will not have another war. I will not. He was extremely concerned about Benito Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia. He was wary of Germany and told Leopold von Heusch, the ambassador of Germany, that they were a peril. And if they continue at such a rate, there will be another war. He actually told British ambassador Eric Phipps to be wary of the Nazis. He did not trust them. George finally gives the first Christmas message in 1932. Parliament had been trying to get George to do this for years. They gave, gifted him a radio, which he quite enjoyed. He really liked the radio. But he was listening to broadcasts about politics or, or sports or fun things um, that were very informal. And the monarchy was a very formal institution. He didn't quite know how he would fit in going on the radio. So he eventually asks his buddy, Ruyard Kipling, to help him write a speech for Christmas. And Kipling had written a few speeches for him, as well as the Jungle Book. The speech was very well received. He told the public he can now talk, thanks to modern science, I can wish you a happy Christmas into your home, and gave them well wishes and support for the new year. It was extremely popular. People loved the king giving them Christmas wishes. They really enjoyed the speech. But George kind of hoped that it would be more of a one-time thing that he would give the speech and and he would be done. He already gave a lot of speeches. And Ramsay MacDonald flagged him down at the next opening of Parliament. Oh, Your Majesty, I loved your speech. And George said, thank you. And he said, uh, Ramsay MacDonald said, you know, Queen Elizabeth I gave a lot of iconic speeches, but we were never able to record them. And they're written, but we never know exactly how she said them. And George just says, damn Queen Elizabeth, knowing that this is now going to be an annual tradition, and he is really not happy about it, though he does it. So George and Mary are actually the first monarchs 
to celebrate their Silver Jubilee. And that represents 25 years on the throne. He celebrated with his family. He had carriage procession who, where he had two of his grandchildren, Princesses Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, going through London to St. Paul's for a service of Thanksgiving with members of European royalty. And the Jubilee was broadcast on radio and the king gave a broadcast to the nation. And he made sure to thank Queen Mary for her support all of these years and everything she had done. He made sure to put it in there because so seldom he remembered to thank her and oftentimes he forgot just verbally to give her a simple thank you. So he made sure for that. They had a 2000 guest ball at Buckingham Palace and a state opening of Parliament. There were crowds and crowds of people that surrounded the streets for the Jubilee. There was tons of souvenirs. There were plates. There were teapots and teacups and many souvenirs for the occasion. And it really showed how popular the monarchy was and how strong it became. The king and queen were absolutely overwhelmed by the support. Queen Mary said, a never to be forgotten day when we celebrated our silver jubilee. It was a glorious summer's day. And George said, I can only say to you, my very dear people, that the queen and I thank you from the depth of our hearts. But the king had actually been very ill for the last 10 years. He had a 19 25 trip to the Mediterranean, instructed by his doctors. By this point, he has chronic bronchitis because of being a heavy smoker. And he tells his doctors in 1928, when he comes very ill once again and needs an operation, he will not go back to the Mediterranean. He very much almost never traveled out of the UK. Since the war, only about three times did he go outside the country. So he goes to Aldwick Seaside Resort on the southern coast near Bognor Regis, and he brings a special person of support, and that is Princess Lilibet. Um, she makes sand castles by the coast while he sits on a park bench. And so she is there supporting her beloved grandpa England as he recovers, though he never really fully recovers from this bout of septicemia. And by 1935, he needed oxygen. We are going to spend a couple minutes talking about that woman, as she's known in the royal family, Wallace Warfield Simpson, and she represents everything that George and Mary hate. So she paints her nails, she owns her own flat, and she has past marriages. And she was, they were absolutely horrified when one night she was snuck into Buckingham Palace wearing a Cartier tiara, and Prince Edward introduces her to Mary and George. Very few words were said, except when George runs up the stairs and says to his private secretary, that woman in my own home, meaning Buckingham Palace. And they met Edward and Wallace meet in the 1930s, and in 1934, there are whispers of a romantic relationship, but Wallace is already married for the second time. So Edward claims that nothing ever happened while Wallace was married, but that is up for debate. Um, and he insists on inviting her to events. And a divorced woman is usually not allowed 
at these types of functions. So Mary and George are very uneasy about having her around, though they kind of hoped that it would end because Edward had had some of these relationships before with married women, like Frida Dudley Ward and Telma Furness. So they're kind of hoping she'll just fade away like the other two. She'll just kind of fall in the, in the background, which kind of is like an approach where you're hoping something will just magically go away, though unfortunately for them, she did not. And by December 1935, George is very ill and his favorite sister, Victoria, dies. So on January 15th, George had a cold, went to his room at Sandringham House where he spends Christmas and he never left that room. And he started drifting in and out of consciousness. At one point where he asked his private secretary, how is the empire? And his private secretary responds, all is well with the empire, your majesty. And George slips back into unconsciousness. And when he was close to death, he sent for Lord Dawson of Penn. They sent for the doctor and by 1155, George was dead. And it was announced in the Times the next day, George's favorite newspaper. And he actually got some comments from all over the world, one of them being by President Roosevelt. And it said, I had the privilege of knowing His Majesty during the war days, and his passing brings me personally special sorrow. But there's something really more sinister about the king's death. And that is the argument that he could have been murdered. And so Lord Dawson of Penn reveals in his diary that he injected the king with fatal doses of morphine and cocaine to assure him a painless death in time for the newspapers to put it in the morning news. This was definitely premeditated as he advised his wife to tell the papers to hold the front page. The king was dying and he was actually a fan and, and studying end of life treatment um, and euthanization. So it could have been premeditated that he decided to end the king's life to make sure the king did not suffer for a longer period of time. Though it has never been revealed whether he asked Queen Mary or Prince Edward about any of this at all, and they never spoke about it. The entries were found in Lord Dawson of Penn's diary when he passed away. And that's when the public first heard about it. So on January 22nd, George's coffin is taken from Sandringham House to St. Mary Magdalene Church. And it stayed overnight with an honor guard. The coffin is then taken two and a half miles to a railway station with the new king and his brothers. And the rest of the royal family follows in carriages in the line, there is George's pony, Jock, and his parrot named Charlotte, who is being carried by a royal household member in her cage. So the funeral train arrived at King's Cross, and they then put the coffin on a gun carriage. And the grenadier guards followed by George's sons to Westminster Hall. Around the time it gets to Westminster Hall, the crown actually falls off the crown into the street. 
And the new king actually took that as a bad omen for his reign. So they sang Psalm number 103 at Westminster Abbey and sang Praise My Soul, King of Heaven, requested by Queen Mary. And the members of parliament paid their respects to the king and so did the public. It's estimated 809,182 people came to say goodbye to their king, including overseas royals and dignitaries. So the coffin is guarded by 12 men at all times. There was a state dinner and the surviving sons actually replaced the guard. And this is called the Vigil of the Princes and they are dressed in uniform. At the funeral, the procession began with Big Ben tolling and the coffin is on the Royal Navy state funeral gun carriage. It is followed by the king and the royal dukes and foreign royals. The princess royal, the queen, and duchesses are in carriages. There are huge crowds and people are actually racing to get a view of the coffin. 150 people are taken to the hospital injured. The coffin passes White Hall, Trafalgar Square, the Mall, St. James, Piccadilly, Hyde Park, Marble Arch, and it ends at Paddington. Then the coffin is loaded onto the train to Windsor. And as it goes up the steps to St. George's Castle, the king and brothers salute the coffin as it goes upstairs. And so it was a simple service. They sang Abide With Me. And today, if you wanted to see George's tomb, he lies in the North Naval Isle in St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. And Queen Mary was buried next to him in 1953. The funeral is broadcast on radio and relayed all through the empire. And there are newsreels that are actually shown at the cinemas. George would have never understood the pomp and pageantry of his funeral. He didn't really understand anything about pomp and pageantry in the monarchy. He stated, I cannot understand it. After all, I am only a very ordinary sort of fellow. But I think it takes someone ordinary to get the people to relate to you and enjoy that type of, of relationship. He also had one final wish. And he once said his oldest son would ruin himself within a year after he passed away. And then said, I pray to God my eldest son will never marry and have children and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. And his oldest son did marry Wallace Simpson, meaning he advocated. He was unable to be king and married to Miss Simpson, so he advocated in favor of his brother, Albert. And Albert eventually took the name George when he was crowned king and so it was a note to his father that he took the name George because it was a reminder to the people how popular the monarchy had been in just over a year. It's also because Queen Victoria never really wanted there to be a King Albert. In the past, people with the name Albert that became the monarch refused the name and took another one preferably one of their middle names because Victoria never wanted there to be a King Albert. It was because she actually approached the idea to Parliament and they turned it down saying, well, when the monarch is female, the consort has to be prince. So eventually, Bertie is coronated on May 12, 1937 
This is a picture from his coronation, coronation and he will be the subject of the next talk in the House of Windsor series. And I'm able to take any questions anybody has. And thank you. Yes? What was your most surprising fact that he dug in George V? Um, I, I think that what most surprised me was um, because he was ordinary, he was more relatable, which I find kind of one of the funnest things about the monarchy is some of them are actually relatable. Um, it was interesting to find how much the people love George, um, more so than some of the members of his own family. Yeah. Yes? When was their 25th, uh, their jubilee, silver jubilee, what year was it? It was 1935. George became king in 1910. So he celebrated the jubilee in 1935, and he died around nine months later. He lived less than a year after that, which is quite a coincidence because the same exact thing happened with Elizabeth II. She didn't live a year or even six six months after her last jubilee. Uh -huh. Why do they always have to have the same names? It's very confusing. It is very confusing and I think they just name after their past relatives and their specific names that they always use because like oh my grandfather was Edward so I'm gonna name this one Edward but um, the next one is George, so they just keep re reusing the names over and over again to memorialize past monarchs, uh, which is why we have so many that are now um, the seventh and at least the third um, after their name with the monarch. All right.